Absolutely. So with that, Danny, you're on controls this evening. A big thank you for everything that you do for us. We'll see you a little later. Sai and Andrew, you're going to join us uh, a little later. We'll call you back. So if we can ask you to turn off your cameras and your microphones, we'll call you back. And uh, that leaves me not only just to welcome everyone around the world, but to say we are going to be full tonight on Zoom. We can only take a thousand concurrent views on Zoom. So if you have friends or family who are trying to get in and can't get into Zoom, we are broadcasting as well on both YouTube and on Facebook. So please, if you can refer your friends and families to those channels as well, if they're unable to join us on Zoom. Just a reminder that the latest edition of the South African Jewish Report actually comes out tomorrow, just before Yom Kippur. We wish everyone really good fast. If you're fasting, may it be meaningful for you. We should be online with the latest edition about 3 p.m. tomorrow afternoon, and you can pick up a copy probably just after Yom Kippur at your spa, your Discam, your pick and pay, your checkers, your exclusive books, your CNA, your garage shop. We're all over the place. Don't forget to pick up your Yom Kippur edition of the South African Jewish Report. And Dina, our next webinar goes from the really serious to the sublime. Uh, but on Thursday, the 23rd, tell us about our next webinar. Absolutely. So next Thursday, we have taken our heed of our feedback and our wishes from our viewers a pet webinar entitled Pets to Plats for. We'll be talking CBD for dogs. We'll be talking divorce and custody. Um, we'll be discussing the psychology of your pet. And we want you to send us photos, videos, whatever it is that you'd like to make your dog or your furry friend or your scaly friend famous. Please send it to us. There are going to be prizes that are going to be awarded. We've got great sponsors. So it is going to just be a really fun webinar, something a bit zany, something new that we haven't done. So please do send us all of your input, get your kids involved, get everyone, the whole family involved. You know, people are very passionate about their pets. So yep, join us next Thursday evening at seven o'clock. Fantastic, Dina. Thank you for joining us. We actually have your husband aunt asking Bill a question a little later. So nice to see all the members of the family online with us tonight. We're and also, and the book was excellent. So I thank you. And just a reminder that we're still recruiting for a new CEO for the South African Jewish Report. So if you're interested in the position of CEO, please don't forget, look at the latest edition of the South African Jewish Report. You'll see the advert there and you can apply at admin at sajewishreport.co.za. And uh, so please do that. And also a reminder that at the bottom of your screen, if you're on Zoom, is a Q&A button. We would like you to have a conversation with Bill Browder. So mm -hmm. if you're watching on Zoom, please put all of your questions in the Q&A button. If you're watching on Facebook or alternatively on YouTube, please just put your questions in the comment section. And Danny and Benji Porter will be moving all of your questions across onto Zoom so we can have a meaningful and deep conversation with Bill, if you don't mind. And a big thank you, Bill. I don't know if you know, you're on here tonight because I uh, I pulled my strings with Philip Kravitz and Tony Leon in order to say, how on earth do we get Bill Browder onto one of our shows? And I wrote to you and literally within seconds, uh, I got a reply back that said you would you would love to do, to do it. So a big welcome to you this evening. And uh, Benji, you're going to be dealing with questions a little later, so we'll see you a little later. Nice to have, have you on the broadcast tonight. So, Bill, I think that there are many people in South Africa and certainly thousands of people who watched or not who've read the book. Now, I don't know if you want to be renowned when on your tombstone is written in a hundred years time. Does it say Bill Browder, the most successful hedge fund manager in Russia? Does it say Bill Browder, the human rights activist? Or does it say Bill Browder, the author or all of those? <clears throat> Well, I, I'm not sure what it'll say. We, we still have, hopefully, I've got a few decades left to to, to define myself. But but the um, uh, I, I would I would say that that um, uh, the work that I'm doing now uh, in human rights and in terms of getting Magnitsky acts passed around the world is by far the most meaningful thing that I've ever done. And and um, well, I should say that the murder of my lawyer Sergei Magnitsky was the most terrible thing that's ever happened to me. And trying to make that right through through some action has given me a mission and my mission has been to go go around the world and to get this legislation passed which punishes the people who killed Sergey and also uh, punishes the people who do similar types of things and uh, 
we've gotten the law passed, the Magnitsky Act passed now in, in 33 different countries. And, and uh, there's a lot of bad guys out there who are feeling not so good about themselves, including um, some bad guys that um, caused a lot of problems in South Africa, the, the Gupta brothers. Who have been sanctioned under the Magnitsky Act. So we'll come to that in a second, but let's actually start in the beginning. You actually come from a family of geniuses, of genii. Uh, you're, not, you're not the first renowned and famous member of your family either. Well, more importantly than that, I'm not a genius. So, so my, 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 my father, um, he, um, at the age of 14, he went to MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, graduated when he was, he was uh, 17, and then had his PhD in math from Princeton by the time he was 21. My brother uh, followed my father's, foot, father's footsteps and went to the University of Chicago um, at 14 and graduated Phi Beta Kappa in physics by the time he was 17 and had his PhD by the time he was 21. And so I'm like definitely the, like the dumb one in the family. And so um, uh, in a certain way that, that, that I had to find a, I had to find a way of, of distinguishing myself outside of the area of genius. And so I, I went into business and, and, um, uh, and for, for a long time, there was, there was not a lot of, um, uh, affirmation that that was the right thing to do in my family, but, but that was the only way I could in any way do something different. Well, I mean, you come from a very different sort of family. Your grandfather was in fact head of the communist party in the United States. That couldn't have been an easy position for you to have ultimately. <clears throat> well, it was a lot harder for him than it was for me. So, so my grandfather, uh, Earl Browder, he was a labor union organizer in Kansas in the 1920s. And he was spotted by the communists. And they said, if you like labor unionism, you're gonna love communism. Why don't you come to Russia and check it out? And so my grandfather in 1927 moved to Moscow and he did what, what many other single red-blooded American men do when they got to Russia. He found a Russian girl who became my grandmother. Um, they had <clears throat> three children. My father was the first. And then they moved back to America and he became the head of the American Communist Party from uh, 1932 to 1945. He ran for president on the communist ticket against Franklin Roosevelt in 1936 and 1940. Um, he was um, uh, then imprisoned by Roosevelt in 41, pardoned in 42, kicked out of the Communist Party in 1945 for being too much of a capitalist and then viciously persecuted for, um, <clears throat> for being a, uh, a communist in the 1950s. And so, this was my family legacy. And then I was going through my teenage rebellion, I guess, rebelling against this family of geniuses that I came from. And I started to figure out what a great, what, what's the best way of rebelling. And I, I, I grew my hair long and you can't tell now because I hardly have any hair, but it, it, um, it, I grew it into an Afro. Um, and strangely that didn't upset my family. I, I followed the Grateful Dead around <clears throat> the United States for, for a couple months. That didn't upset my family. But then I figured out the perfect way of upsetting my family, which was to put on a suit and tie and become a capitalist, you know, coming from this family of geniuses and communists. And, um, and that definitely upset my family. And so I, I became a capitalist. I went to Stanford Business School in 1987, and I graduated business school in 1989. And that was the year that the Berlin Wall had come down. <clears throat> and as I was trying to figure out what to do with my, uh, my life, I had this epiphany one day, which is that um, if my grandfather was the biggest communist in America and the Berlin Wall has just come down, I'm going to try to become the biggest capitalist in Eastern Europe. And, and in 1989, after I finished business school, that's what I set out to do. And, and I eventually succeeded, actually, in, at least um, by some measures. So your success actually turns you into the black sheep of the family. Um, <laughs> Well, I would say being the black sheep of the family kind of inspired me to a certain type of success that um, wasn't, wasn't even recognized in my family. It, it, it was actually only after Harvard Business School wrote a case study about my fund in Russia that my father first acknowledged, and this was like 15 years after I started my career, first acknowledged maybe I'm doing something that's somewhat worthy. If Harvard had got, got involved, then, then that must be good. <laughs> But you, you land up working for Robert Maxwell. What was that like? Oh, my God. So not, not easy, not good. So, I, um, uh, so my first job out of business school um, <clears throat> was, uh, was working as a management consultant in Poland for the Boston Consulting Group. Well, I should say I worked in London, and they sent me out to Poland. And the first, um, the first thing I did when I got out to Poland was I discovered 
the very first Polish privatizations. And I had a total of, of uh, I'll get to Maxwell in a second, but let me just tell the story because it gets you to Maxwell. And I, I had a total of $2,000 of net worth at the time. And I invested my $2,000 in the very first Polish privatizations. And over the next year or, or year and a half, my $2,000 turned into $20,000. And I said to myself, now, if anyone who's ever made 10 times their money on an investment, you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, it makes you want to go and do it again. It's kind of like a, a crack cocaine for the financial world. And so uh, I wanted to go out and make another 10 times my money. I wanted to be an investor in Eastern Europe. And, and um, I looked around to say, well, where, where can I invest in? How can I invest in Eastern Europe? How do I, um, how do, I do this? And the only job going at the time was to be a, an associate for Robert Maxwell, who had a very, who had a small Eastern European fund because he came from that part of the world. And so I started um, working for Maxwell and everyone told me, don't go to work for Maxwell. He'll fire you within moments because he, he's, he's the most volatile man in the world. He's got the worst temper on earth. And um, I thought, you know what? I go to work for Maxwell and if I get fired, I can always just go back to consulting or whatever, but this is an opportunity to do what I really want to do. And so I go to work for Maxwell. We make a bunch of investments in Eastern Europe. And then for, the, for those of you who know the story, Robert Maxwell, um, he had a yacht um, and he, um, uh, nobody knows what really happened on this yacht, but, but his, uh, after uh, basically committing a terrible crime against his pensioners, stealing all the pensioners' money, he either jumped off, was pushed off, or fell off his yacht and died. <clears throat> and so I never got fired from Maxwell because um, he died um, before that. And, um, uh, and then, of course, this fraud was exposed and it was all very terrible and, and um, <clears throat> it was not a good place to have on your CV. It's kind of like um, it was that was uh, 25 years ago or maybe even longer, 30 years ago. But it's, it, it would be the equivalent today of having uh, Bernie Madoff on your resume. Um, and so it wasn't easy to get a job after working for Maxwell. So when you make the decision that money can be made in Eastern Europe, particularly in Russia, that that crack cocaine that you speak about, there's an opportunity. Paint for us a picture of what mm -hmm. Russia looked like in those early days. Well, so, so after Maxwell, my, my, um, my, my, I went to work for uh, Solomon Brothers. And my first assignment at Solomon Brothers on the, uh, on the East European team was to go to Russia and to... Um, advised the management of a fishing fleet called the Murmansk Trawler Fleet on their privatization. <clears throat> and the Murmansk Trawler Fleet is located in this town called Murmansk, which is a couple hundred miles north of the Arctic Circle. And so I, I um, take a plane to St. Petersburg. I then change planes in the middle of the night in St. Petersburg, and I arrive in Murmansk. And the head of the fishing fleet uh, takes, me, takes me down, to, before we have our meetings, takes me down to the docks so I can see one of their boats. And on, on the dock, is this enormous vessel. It's like uh, 400 feet long on five different stories. On the top, the, uh, they have the nets to catch the fish. And then the next level, they separate the fish and on all the way down until the bottom level of the boat, they actually have canning machines on this boat um, where they can the fish. And so it's like an ocean going, fully integrated fish factory. And I asked the, um, the, the head of the um, fishing fleet, how much does one of these things cost? And he said, uh, $20 million new. And I said, how many of them do you have in your fleet? He said, 100. So I do the math, 20 million times 100 gets you to $2 billion worth of ships. And I said, what's the age of your fleet? And he said, on average, it's about seven years. And so not knowing anything about shipping or fishing or anything like that, I figured maybe that makes it half depreciated. So a billion dollars worth of ships. And the management of this fishing fleet had hired me to advise on, on whether or not they should um, exercise their legitimate right under the privatization program of Russia to buy 51%. And so I asked him, at, at what price is the government selling management uh, 51%? And he said, two and a half million dollars. So let me just repeat the math for you again. So you can buy two and a half million dollars, for two and a half million dollars, you can buy 51% of the fishing fleet with ships worth a billion dollars. So you don't have to be a Stanford MBA or some type of financial expert to know that that's a good deal. And, um, and it brought me back to that feeling that I had in my stomach from Poland, 
which is, you know, my first 10 bagger. I thought, well, what am I doing advising on this stuff? I need to be investing in this stuff. And that's what inspired me to become an investor in Russia. Did they really not understand what was happening? I, I mean, was they coming out of a communist era, the Soviet empire is busy collapsing. These basic pr principles of capitalism, was it foreign to the people in the country at the time? It was completely, nobody knew anything. It was just completely, absolutely foreign. And, and nobody had any idea what any of this stuff meant. And, and so, and it, and it wasn't rocket science. I mean, you had oil companies traded at a 99.7% discount to oil companies in the West based on the oil reserves in the ground. You had electricity companies and telephone companies that traded at 99.5% discount. And it was all really obvious to anybody who did the math, but you know, you have to kind of know how, how to, you have to know how to do basic, you know, sort of economic calculations and nobody had been trained in any of that stuff. So no, nobody knew anything. It was just true. It was crazy. Um, but what was, what was more interesting than, than the Russians not knowing is that people in the West didn't, didn't understand it either. When I went around with these numbers and showed people in the West, trying to convince them to invest in Russia, they all looked like, look at me like I was some kind of lunatic that, you know, why would, you know, who's, who's, who would ever consider investing in Russia? No way. And so it's, I mean, everybody kind of, for one reason or another, didn't want to acknowledge this, uh, you know, economic opportunity of a lifetime. So it really all begins with Boris Yeltsin. Uh, Yeltsin, who's a corrupt leader, and he creates a class that's now become part of our lexicon, this group of oligarchs. Who were the oligarchs who actually controlled Russia at this time? So, so originally the idea that Boris Yeltsin created, and you're right, he was corrupt, was the idea that um, to go from communism to capitalism, you had to make people capitalists. How do you make people capitalists? His, his brainchild was this idea of, of taking all the assets in the country which at that time before, uh, during the Soviet times were owned by the state and distributing them effectively for free to the population through different mechanisms. One of them was that thing I told you about with the fishing fleet, but then another one was called voucher privatization. And, and the idea was that everybody should become a capitalist. But the reality was, and I don't know whether they knew this in advance and were just being highly cynical or whether this is just how it turned out, but the reality was that instead of the whole country um, becoming capitalist and everyone having a vested interest in capitalism, every, everyone was, was distributed a, a, a certificate called a voucher, which you could then exchange for shares and become a capitalist. But instead of um, holding their vouchers and exchanging them for shares, everyone sold their vouchers for a bottle of cheap vodka. And then people who were selling the vodka collected the vouchers. And then eventually they found their way into the hands of these people known as the oligarchs. And, um, and so the oligarchs ended up, ended up 22 individuals ending up uh, controlling 44% of the country. Um, <clears throat> for, for, for Just, just run us through that maths again. Did you say 22 people controlled 44% of all of Russia? Correct. Um, and, and, um, and, I mean, it's just, it, it, so what, what, what they ended up doing was creating the, the, the most, the greatest wealth imbalance that's ever existed in the history of the world. Everyone else was living in, in dire poverty. <clears throat> and, and you've got this, uh, group of this small group of, of people who um, were just, I mean, the, the wealth was, was obscene and, you know, the yachts and the planes and the villas and, and there was no, they weren't paying taxes. They weren't donating money to charity. And, and the average life expectancy for a man was like 57 years in Russia because the hospitals were all shut down. And I mean, it's, it's just terrible. So I, I got to Russia, I think for the first time in 2006, and you saw these big black uh, limousines driving around, Mercedes usually, and they would stop outside the store and guys with machine guns would get out and there would be a ton of steel under every vehicle because the <laughs> oligarchs were also killing each other at this point in time. It really was the Wild West. Well, so, so the one thing which they didn't do in Russia, so they, they created capitalism, which was kind of like building a house. But when they created this, when they built this house, they forgot to put in the plumbing and electricity. And the plumbing electricity were, it was like rule of law, um, property rights. <clears throat> and so um, when you don't have a rule of law, what do you end up with? You have a rule of the jungle. And the rule of the jungle was, you know, might makes right. And the, and the most powerful and the, and the most vicious people ended up becoming the most successful people. 
And, and what you witnessed there was just a, a small snippet, a, a tip of the iceberg of, of this unbelievable murderous um, scenario, which was created by, by uh, effectively not having any rules. And, and it wasn't that there's a, there's a, a common perception that, that Russia's um, got, got a, an intense mafia, the Russian mafia. Um, and people view this mafia as guys with guns and black Mercedes and gold teeth and all this kind of stuff. But the reality is the Russian mafia um, is no longer distinguished from the Russian government. So you know, it's no longer the um, gold teeth guys. It's um, guys in, wearing Brioni suits who are cabinet ministers who are also ordering hits on their business rivals and people who are trying to muscle in on their money. So, in fact, the, the law that, as it was explained to me, was if no one's trying to kill you, you're just not important enough in Russia. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting. Yes, exactly. So, I, 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 you know, what, what I discovered was that, that not just kill you, but, but um, as an investor, <clears throat> um, uh, it became obvious pretty, pretty soon after I was there that, that everyone was stealing from everybody and the government was getting involved. And the, when I said government, government officials were getting involved and trying to steal and and um, and I used to encounter these um, people who had who had these ideas about how how to avoid getting burned in Russia, and they would say, you know, we just don't go at, we we don't invest in in strategic companies like oil and gas or electricity or telecommunications, and and therefore we're fine. And I and I, I remember vividly having multiple conversations like this, and and I said, no, you're not fine because the o- the only companies where you won't get ripped off in if you invest in them are companies that don't have don't make any money. So if you want to invest in companies that don't make any money, you'll be fine. Otherwise, you know, you're, you're fresh meat. They're going to come right after you. No, no question about it. And they come after everybody. There's not a person who's making money in Russia that doesn't end up getting exploited, extorted, threatened, um, arrested, whatever. I mean, it's just a terrible, terrible place. And there's no way to avoid it. Is the country run as a country or is the country run as a business by its political elite? The country is run as a criminal organization by the, by the chief capo, which is the president of the country. And what I mean by that is that uh, uh, Vladimir Putin, um, uh, his first and foremost reason for being president was to steal as much money as he could get his hands on. People say that he, the man wants power. Well, in Russia, power equals money. Money is power, power is money. And so for him, he needs to get his, steal as much money uh, as he can get his hands on. And, um, and how does he do that? He, he, the main way he does that is by using the law enforcement apparatus of the country to arrest anybody or to threaten to arrest anybody who doesn't hand over half their money to him. And so he's running a protection racket where um, he, he, you, you're faced with it with a, um, a deal. You can either, um, uh, hand over half your money and not fuss about it. Or if you fuss about it, you can hand over all your money and go to jail. So what do these people do? They hand over half their money. And so when you see a Russian oligarch who claims to be worth $15 billion, seven and a half billion dollars of that money belongs to Vladimir Putin. So you set up office in Moscow and one of the first opportunities you come across is that of Gazprom. Tell us yeah. the Gazprom story. So Gazprom trades at a 99.7% discount to Exxon or traded, traded, that doesn't trade there anymore, traded at a 99.7% discount to Exxon and BP per barrel of hydrocarbon reserves. So when we first looked at Gazprom, and this was around 1999, we said to ourselves, why is it so cheap? And the answer was, it's so cheap, it was so cheap, because everybody in the market assumed that everything was being stolen out of the company. They assumed that it was just being completely robbed blind. And so we did something in 1999, which had never been done before at Gazprom, which was a stealing analysis. We wanted to do a stealing analysis to figure out how much really was stolen. Were they stealing everything or, or, or not? Well, how do you do a stealing analysis of a Russian company? They, they didn't teach this course at Stanford Business School. Um, you certainly couldn't go to the management and say, you know, excuse me, sir, can you tell me how much you're stealing? Because they'll, um, <laughs> they won't tell you and they probably do a lot worse. Nor could you go to the investment banks that existed in Russia at the time 
and ask them what was being stolen out of Gazprom because they were so busy um, with their noses up the backside of Gazprom management trying to get any kind of fee paying business. The last thing they wanted to do was say anything that might jeopardize their relationship. And so what we did was we went around to all of the um, people who might know about the stealing, ex-employees, customers, competitors, suppliers, government officials, ex-government officials. And I asked these people all for breakfast, lunch, dinner, tea, coffee, dessert, without telling them in advance what I wanted to um, talk about. And most people were kind of curious what this sort of, Amer uh, you know, sort of fund manager with an American accent wanted to do inviting them to lunch. And so a lot of them agreed to have lunch with me. And when I posed the question, what's being stolen out of Gazprom? I didn't know whether people would just like shut down at that point or not, but it turned out that everybody um, was being, all these people who I met with were being cut out of the stealing. And so they were furious that they weren't getting a piece of the action. And so they all wanted to share all the dirty business of Gazprom. And so they would just lean forward and tell me the most outrageous things about what was going on at Gazprom. And I, I, um, I took notes, uh, copious notes at, at, at all these meals and filled up several notebooks full of information about the stealing of Gazprom. But then the problem was, how do I know any of this stuff is true? I mean, it could be sour grapes, it could be misinformation, God knows what. I mean, you know, this is just gossip over lunch. And I knew that there was something big going on, but I had no idea. It's not like I could share it with the press because the press can't write about gossip at lunch and nor could I share it with law enforcement because what is law enforcement going to do with it? And then we had this unbelievable break. My head of research, uh, a Russian guy named Vadim Kleiner was um, at a traffic light at Pushkin Square in Moscow. And, and for anyone who's ever been to Moscow, Pushkin Square is a place where the traffic gets really snarled up, like really badly snarled up. Like you could be sitting there for an hour. And, um, and so as a result of the traffic jams, um, this group of enterprising street urchins has sort of set up a business selling things to motorists who are sitting there trapped in their cars. And the kids are selling newspapers and lighters and cigarettes and, and pirated DVDs and all sorts of stuff. And, and um, uh, one, some kid comes to the window of Vadim's car and he rolls down the window and, and he says to the kid, what do you got? And the kid says, um, I'm selling databases. And he opens up his, his dirty down parka and he's got this plastic folders with these disks in them. And, and, he's, and Vadim said, what do you mean databases? And he says, for example, uh, this one's the uh, 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 customs committee database. And then they said, uh, this one is the Moscow registration chamber database. And so Vadim uh, he said, he said, how much? He said, five bucks. So Vadim buys the um, Moscow registration chamber database. And then he comes back to the office waving this disc around in the air. He said, I've just bought the Moscow registration chamber database, which is a database which has all sorts of information about company ownership uh, in, in Russia. And I say to Vadim, there's no way. Uh, I'm sure you got ripped off. And so we put it into the computer. And sure enough, he didn't get ripped off. It was the Moscow Registration Chamber database that we could then for five bucks. But the most funny thing on it was that when we popped the disk out, there was a phone number on the, on the, on the disk. And it said, well, you can call for the other databases. And so we, uh, we called up the number to get the, all the other databases. And those only cost $1. He did, it was like a 500% markup at the uh, traffic lights. And so we bought all the other databases and from those databases, which is all uh, sort of official government information just sold on the black market, we were able to then cross-reference that against the um, information that we had uh, from all these lunches and dinners and teas and coffees and desserts. And we were able to paint a very accurate picture of what had been stolen out of Gazprom. And what we learned was that between 1996 and 1999, um, the management of Gazprom, the senior management of Gazprom, <clears throat> which consisted of about seven people, um, stole oil and gas reserves equal to the size of Kuwait out of Gazprom. This was like uh, under the noses of the whole world, seven individuals stole oil and gas reserves the size of Kuwait. <clears throat> if you remember, there was a war fought over oil and gas reserves the size of Kuwait. In Kuwait, it was called the first Gulf War. Um, where, and so here you have a similar situation happen and nobody even knew about it. <clears throat> So that was the first big discovery. The second big discovery was that oil and gas reserves the size of Kuwait only represented 9.65% of Gazprom's total reserves. In other words, more than 90% hadn't been stolen. Now remember, this is a company that's trading at a 99%, 99.7% discount because everybody assumes everything has been stolen. 
And we've just proven with good evidence that almost everything hasn't been stolen. So what did we do? Well, to use a very uh, technical financial term, uh, we backed up the truck and we bought as much gas prom as we could possibly get our hands on. It became my single largest investment in my, uh, in my fund. Um, and that's normally where you stop as a um, financial investor. You know, you find something that other people don't know about. Um, uh, you make your, you take your position and then you wait. But I was too impatient to wait. I wanted the whole world to find out what was going on. So we took all of this analysis that we did, the stealing analysis, and I broke it into seven chapters. And I shared one chapter with the Wall Street Journal, the next chapter with the Financial Times, the next one with the Business Week, the next one with Washington Post. And they all wrote articles about the stealing that was going on at Gazprom. And as a result of those articles, um, you ended up first having, first the Western press picked it up, then the Russian press picked it up. And as a result of, of uh, the Russian press picking it up, um, then you had uh, Gazprom management got involved and they hired uh, a big American accounting firm to write a report to say it was a good thing that these assets were stolen. Uh, then you had parliamentary, a parliamentary debate about whether it was a good thing or a bad thing for all these assets to be stolen. And finally, um, this was, uh, I'm trying, this was um, 2005, I think. Yeah, 2005, um, yeah, maybe, maybe earlier, I can't, yeah. Um, Vladimir Putin steps in and Vladimir Putin steps in. No, he, this is 2003, he steps in and um, he replaces the, um, uh, the guy who was doing all the stealing at Gazprom uh, with another guy. Um, and the other guy's uh, uh, job it is, he claims, uh, which is to stop the assets from being stolen at Gazprom. He makes this announcement and the share price doubles the next day. And I should stress, he says, stop the, stealing the assets. It's perfectly okay to steal the cash flow, just not the assets. So the share price doubles the next day. Um, it then doubles again. It then doubles again after that. And then it doubles again after that, and again after that, and it doubles again and again. By the time we were done with Gazprom, the share price had gone up a hundred times from when we first bought it. Um, and this was not some micro cap company or some you know ten thousand dollar seed investment. This was like an enormous position that we had. It was the single most profitable investment I've ever made, and most anyone has ever made. I mean, it was just a gigantic uh, economic success, and. Um, uh, and so uh, that, that was the story of Gazprom. So how profitable was the Hermitage Fund? What sort of returns were investors get? Well, it, it was a bit of a roller coaster because so if you got in at the very beginning when I started, it went up uh, 900%. Uh, and then it, it crashed 90%. Um, and so it depends. And you could come and go whenever you wanted. And so... However, at the bottom of the market, after, so after we had 10 cents on the dollar, um, it went up something like 45 times from there. And so by the time we were done, um, uh, we had four and a half billion dollars invested in the Russian stock market. And I should point out that when I first started, I started with 25 million. And so I was, was the largest- Edwin Safra's money originally. It was Edwin Safra's money originally. He was my original investor. So, um, and so he, he and his family made a lot of money. He then sold his bank to HSBC. They made a lot of money. I made a lot of money. My clients made a lot of money. It was all very, all very good. The problem was that all these exposés that I was doing, like the one at Gazprom, um, you know, was starting to like really upset a lot of people. And uh, in November of 2005, after I'd been there for 10 years, um, I was, I'd come to London for the weekend and I went, flew back to Moscow. And when I was going through immigration, at Sheremetyevo Airport, um, I was arrested and I was um, put in the detention center of the airport. I was then held for 15 hours. I wasn't sure whether I was being sent to Siberia or deported. And thankfully the next morning I was put on an Aeroflot flight back to London, uh, deported and declared a threat to national security not to be allowed to return to Russia ever again. And um, that I began. Mean the next Bill, chapter of my life. A billion, in the early days, you and Putin were in fact on the same side. You, you suited his interests. 
but but that changed. What was it that changed that put you on opposite sides of the fight? Well, so originally when, he, when, when Vladimir Putin first came to power in 1999, um, uh, he was really president of the presidential administration of Russia. He wasn't really president of Russia. Why wasn't he president of Russia? Because these oligarchs had um, de facto stolen his power. They were bribing officials right up and down the, the food chain of the, of the officialdom. They were bribing members of parliament. And so he, he, he didn't really have power as a president. And so he was really angry with these oligarchs. And so was I. I was angry with them because they were stealing money from me. He was angry at them because he was, they were stealing power from him. And so every time I would do one of these exposés, like the one I did at Gazprom, he would step in and do something about it. And, um, and every time he stepped in, the, the value of my investments went up. And so for a while, it was this unbelievably great situation, which is that I could, um, uh, I could do good exposing corrupt by exposing corruption and make money at the same time. And Putin, um, and I should say, I never met Putin. I, I've never met him or spoken to him to this day, but there's this expression, your enemy's enemy is your friend. And, and, and here we have a situation where um, I was going after his enemies. And, and, um, and so it worked out really well until the moment that he decided that he was gonna win his war with the oligarchs. How did he go about doing this? He decided in October of 2003 to arrest the richest oligarch in Russia. It was a man named Mikhail Hordakovsky. He was the owner of an oil company called Yukos. And um, uh, Hordakovsky was landing his private jet at an airport in Siberia. And um, I guess Putin knew his flight plans and the secret police of Russia, they're called the FSB, surrounded the jet. They arrested him. They brought him back to Moscow. And then they put him on trial for tax evasion. And in, in Russia, when you're put on trial in a criminal case, um, there's almost 100% certainty that you're going to jail. It's like, again, like 99.8% conviction rate. And because of that, they, um, uh, they just assume you're, you're guilty and they, they put you in a cage as they put you in the defendant's cage where you sit because when you're done, you're gonna be in that cage uh, when you're being, been found guilty. And so they put Hordakovsky in the cage and then, then Putin allowed the television cameras to come in the courtroom and film Mikhail Hordakovsky, the richest man in Russia, the owner of Yukos, sitting in a cage. Now, imagine you're the 17th richest man in Russia. This is the summer of 2004 when he's on, when Hordakovsky is on trial. Uh, you're the 17th richest man in Russia. You're on your yacht. It's parked off the Hotel du Cap in Antibes, France. Uh, you just finished up with your mistress in the bedroom. You're on your way out to the living room. You click on CNN. And there you see a guy far richer, uh, far smarter, and far more powerful than you sitting in a cage. What's your natural reaction? You don't want to sit in the cage yourself. And so one by one by one, the oligarchs went to Putin. And this was after Hordakovsky was sentenced to 10 years in prison. And they said to Putin, wow, that was pretty intense. What do we have to do to make sure we don't sit in a cage? And that's when Putin said 50%. And not 50% for the Russian government or 50% for the presidential administration of Russia, 50% for Vladimir Putin. And that's when he became the richest man in the world. And that's when my interests and in his diverged. Because at that point, uh, all of my exposés, all my stealing analysis was going after his 50% interest. And that's why he decided to, um, he had three choices with me. He could have killed me, arrested me, or kicked me out. He chose the least onerous option, thank God and I was expelled from the country on November 13th, 2005. So how rich is Vladimir Putin and where is his money? Um, Vladimir Putin, uh, I estimate to be worth $200 billion, maybe more at this point. Um, uh, he doesn't hold any money in his own name um, because if he does, if he did, then anybody who had a piece of paper showing that could use it to blackmail him. And since he's an expert on blackmail, because that's what they do at the FSB, the secret police, uh, he knows that that's not what he wants to become subject to. And so he has these arrangements with the oligarchs um, to hold his money uh, for him. And, um, and so when you, so uh, you see some oligarch owning a, uh, you know, jet or a private equity fund or a piece of real estate or anything, um, there's a good chance that Vladimir Putin is the one who's behind that. 
And so, uh, and and this is not. Um, uh, I'm not speculating. This is this is um, proven to be true in a number of different situations. Um, there's a, there you know after you know 20 years of this stuff, there's a lot of information that leaks out, and there's enough information that's leaked out to show that this is absolutely the case. And for anyone who's interested, there's a book um, which was published by uh, uh, one of one of my journalist friends, one of the people who's helping me expose Putin back in the day, or not, or not expose Putin, but expose the oligarchs back in the day before I was exposing Putin. Uh, uh, her name is Catherine Belton, and she wrote a book called Putin's People. And her book um, goes into an unbelievable uh, forensic detail about the theft of uh, money from the Russian state by Putin and the oligarchs, and it's really well worth a read. So now he boots you out of the country, and you actually start divesting of all of your interests in Russia. And in fact, you managed to get all, all of your money out. Yep. In theory, that should have been the end of the story, but yep. it wasn't. No. So we, we got all our money out. And I should point out, we got all our people out. I, I said, what can they do to me af after kicking me out? They could arrest my people or seize my assets. We sold everything, got all our people out. And I, and, um, I kept an office there with one secretary just in case the storm ever blew over. But um, I went out to do other things. I set up a new fund investing in other parts of the world and started to invest. And, um, and then 18 months after I was expelled, I get a frantic call from the uh, secretary in the office in Moscow saying that there's 25 police officers here raiding the office. What should I do? And uh, I say, I don't know. Let me call my lawyer. I call my lawyer. And he sounds a bit distracted when I get him on the phone, my Moscow lawyer. And uh, I say, well, I got these officers raiding my office. What should I do? And he said, there's, I don't know. There's 25 police officers raiding my office looking for your documents. Let me get back to you. On that day, June 4th, 2007, 50 police officers raided my office and the office of my American law firm where we kept all of our corporate documents. And the purpose of this raid was to, was to seize all the stamps, seals, and certificates for our investment holding companies, the companies that were now empty, they didn't know that, through which we had previously invested our money in Russia. They got all those documents. And then the next thing we know, we no longer own our investment holding companies. Using the documents seized by the police, they had been fraudulently re-registered in a highly complex identity theft. And instead of HSBC, my partner, being the nominal shareholder of these companies, uh, a man who had been convicted of manslaughter and let out of jail early uh, by the police had become the registered owner of these companies. It was at this point that I hired the smartest young lawyer I knew, a young man named Sergei Magnitsky, um, to investigate. Uh, Sergey investigated and he came back and he said, there were two parts of the scam. Now, the first part was to steal all of your money, but thankfully you got your money out before they could do that. He said, however, the second part they succeeded in. And the second part was that after we had sold everything in Russia, we had a profit of a billion dollars and we paid to the Russian government $230 million of capital gains tax. And what Sergei had discovered was that the people who stole our companies had gone back to the tax authorities and filed an amended tax return where they claimed that these companies previously hadn't earned a billion dollars, but earned zero. And they came up with a complicated way of explaining that. And because of that, they said um, they wanted to adjust the tax return in the previous year. And, and by adjusting it in the previous year, they wanted to get the $230 million of taxes refunded. They applied for this $230 million illegal tax refund on the 23rd of December, 2007, two days before Christmas. And it was approved and paid out the next day. The largest tax refund in the history of Russia paid out in one day. Sergei had discovered all this. And Sergei and I were both convinced that this must be a rogue operation because Putin is a nationalist, he's a patriot. He wouldn't have, I mean, it's one thing to allow our stuff to be stolen, but this was the Russian government's money that was being stolen. And so we figured if we just brought this to the attention of the right people, um, then the good guys would get the bad guys. And so we wrote criminal complaints to every different law enforcement agency in Russia. Um, I went to the TV, radio, newspapers, told the whole story. And Sergei went to the Russian State Investigative Committee, their version of the FBI, and gave sworn witness testimony against the police officers involved in the fraud. And then we sat back 
and waited for the good guys to get the bad guys. Well, it turns out that in, in uh, Vladimir Putin's Russia, there are no good guys. <clears throat> Instead of arresting the people who committed this uh, terrible uh, uh, tax fraud, um, the people who committed the fraud <laughs> Um, came and arrested Sergei Magnitsky and they put him in jail and then they started to torture him to get him to withdraw his testimony. They put him in cells with uh, 14 inmates and eight beds and left the lights on 24 hours a day to impose sleep deprivation. And they put him in cells with no heat and no, electri- uh, no window panes in December in Moscow so he nearly froze to death. They put him in cells with no toilet, just a hole in the floor where the sewage would bubble up. They'd move him from cell to cell to cell in the middle of the night. And the purpose of all this was to get him to withdraw his testimony against these corrupt police officers and to get him to sign a false confession to say that he stole the $230 million and he did so on my instruction. And Sergei, although he looked just like a, you know, uh, you know, sort of a soft lawyer, um, he wore a, you know, blue suit and a white shirt and a red tie to work and bought his coffee at Starbucks in the morning. And they figured that, you know, within a week, this type of pressure will make him buckle but it, and he well, was a youngster is what 37 yeah he's 37 he was 30 when, he, when they arrested him when when they arrested him he was 36 and young guy and um but what they didn't understand about sergey magnitsky was he was a man of unbelievable principle and integrity for him the idea of perjuring himself and bearing false witness was more awful than the physical pain they were subjecting him to and um he wouldn't he wouldn't do what they asked and so the pressure and the torture got worse and worse and after about six months of this, um, he started to, um, his health started to deteriorate. He ended, he ended up um, uh, getting terrible pains in his stomach. He lost 20 kilos and he was diagnosed as having uh, pancreatitis and gallstones and, and needing an operation, um, uh, which was scheduled for the 1st of August, uh, 2009. Uh, a week before the operation, <clears throat> they came to him again, again, asked him to sign a false confession. Again, he refused. And in retaliation, they, they abruptly moved him to a maximum security prison called Butyrka, which is considered to be one of the roughest prisons in Russia. And most significantly for Sergei, there was no medical facilities there to treat his pancreatitis and gallstones. And at Butyrka, he was left completely without medical attention. His, his health continued to deteriorate. He went into constant agonizing pain. It's a very, very painful ailment to have pancreatitis. Um, it got worse and worse and worse. He and his lawyers got desperate. They wrote 20 different requests to every different branch of the criminal justice system, begging for medical attention. Every one of their requests was either ignored or denied. And on the night of November 16, 2009, <clears throat> this is 12 years ago, Sergei Magnitsky went into critical condition. On that night, the Butyrka authorities didn't want to have responsibility for him anymore. And so they put him in an ambulance and sent him to a different prison <clears throat> that had a medical wing. When he arrived at the other prison, <clears throat> instead of putting him in the emergency room, they put him in an isolation cell. They chained him to a bed and eight riot guards with rubber batons beat Sergei until he died. <clears throat> he was 37 years old. He left a wife and two children. That was 12 years ago. I got the news of his murder the next morning and it was the most horrifying traumatic, life-changing news I could have ever gotten. Sergei Magnitsky was effectively killed because, as my proxy because he worked for me. If he hadn't worked for me, he'd still be alive today. And so when I was able to get past the fog of, of heartbreak and hysteria to think clearly, uh, I decided at that moment to put aside everything else I was doing and to devote all of my time, all of my resources, and all of my energy going after the people who killed him um, make sure they face justice. And for the last 12 years, that's what I've been doing. So you've managed to get through the United States uh, Congress, through the Canadian Parliament, and partly through the UK uh, Parliament as well, the Midnitsky Act. Explain to us what that is and how how it's being used to sanction both Russians and others. And then we're going to talk about its very important relevance for, for South Africa, because there are many South African connections to your story. The one is Russia issued a red notice, uh, an international arrest warrant to Interpol for you at a time where Jackie Celebi, the South African corrupt 
the commissioner of police was in fact head of head of uh, Interpol. Um, and of course, the Magnitsky Act has now been used against the Guptas as well. So explain to us what the Magnitsky Act is, how does it work, and then let's talk about its relevance for South Africa. So after Sergei died, I said to myself, I, I, you know, I can't live with myself unless I get justice for him. And so originally we, we thought maybe we could get justice in Russia. I mean, it's, he, he did something very unusual. He documented everything in writing. Um, he, he wrote 450 criminal complaints about his mistreatment in prison um, during his 358 days in detention. And he could write, handwrite these things and hand the, the stack of complaints to his lawyer once a month who would file them. They would always be ignored or denied, but we got copies of them. And from these copies, we had the most granular record of human rights abuses that's come out of Russia in the last 35 years. And because of that, we thought we would get some justice in Russia. But it, but it turns out that even the little guys, even the, the executors um, weren't found liable. The, the Russian authorities circled the wagons um, Vladimir Putin got involved himself in exonerating every single person who played a role in Sergei Magnitsky's false arrest, torture, and murder. Um, some of the people who were most involved got promotions and state honors. And in the most shocking miscarriage of justice, three years after they killed Sergei, they put him on trial in the first ever trial against a dead man in the history of Russia. So it became obvious we needed to get justice outside of Russia. Well, how do you get justice outside of Russia for a crime that's been committed inside of Russia? And the answer is, at the time, there were no legal mechanisms to do so. Um, and so I came up with an idea, which is that they killed Sergei Magnitsky for money. They killed him for $230 million. And the people who killed him don't keep that money in Russia. They keep it in the West. They send their kids to boarding school in Switzerland. They send their wives uh, to South Beach in Miami. They send their girlfriends on shopping trips to Milan. They have villas in the south of France. They have accounts in, in big banks in London. And I said to myself, if we can freeze their assets and ban their visas, that won't be true justice, but that will hit them where it counts and they'll be a hell of a lot better than total impunity. And, um, and so I took this idea to, to a democratic senator from Maryland uh, named Benjamin Cardin and a Republican senator from Arizona, the late John McCain. And I told him the story I've just shared with you tonight. And I said, can we freeze the assets and ban the visas of the people who killed Sergei Magnitsky? And they said, yes. And that became the Magnitsky Act. And originally the Magnitsky Act was just for Sergei Magnitsky. But when they put it on the books, um, uh, all of a sudden that had a, uh, a, a real... Um, uh, effect on all other Russians who were victimized. And they all, all these other Russians started ringing, ringing these senators and saying, you know, you found the Achilles heel of the Putin regime. Can you add the people who killed my husband, my brother, my sister, my aunt to your law? And after about a dozen of these calls, these senators realized they're, they're on something much bigger than just one case. And they added 65 words to the law to apply to all Russian human rights abusers. So when it went for a vote in November of 2012, it passed the Senate 92 to four, it passed the House of Representatives with 89%, and President Obama signed it into law on December 14, 2012. The moment he signed it into law, Putin just went out of his mind. He banned the adoption of Russian orphans by American families in retaliation, and he made it his single largest foreign policy priority to repeal the Magnitsky Act, somehow thinking that that would intimidate the Americans. Maybe they would, I don't know, do whatever they're going to do but it had no such effect. Instead, these two senators said to themselves, well, if Vladimir Putin is getting so upset about this, there's probably a lot of other dictators and kleptocrats that deserve this as well. And that became the Global Magnitsky Act. And in um, 2000, December 2016, the Global Magnitsky Act was passed. The following year in Canada, the Canadian Global Magnitsky Act was passed in October of 2017. In July of 2018, the British Magnitsky Act was passed. In December of 2020, the um, uh, EU Magnitsky Act was passed. There's one coming up in Australia. There's one in Kosovo, uh, Montenegro. There's one in Jersey, Gibraltar, Cayman Islands, British Virgin Islands. Um, and the world is becoming a pretty inhospitable place for a certain group of people. And, and you mentioned the South African connection. Um, well, um, you probably know a lot better than I do about the Gupta brothers. These guys were, were robbing your country dry. And um, 
nobody was doing anything about it. To this day, nobody's done anything about it. I mean, it's truly remarkable. Well, well now, now somebody's done something about it. The United States Treasury has sanctioned the Gupta brothers. And when you get put on the US sanctions list, it doesn't just affect your US assets. No bank in the world wants to be uh, caught by the US Treasury doing business with a sanctioned individual. And that could be an Indian bank, a South African bank, a Dubai bank. Nobody wants to be caught doing business with these characters. And I guarantee you, they're sitting there think, wait, thinking about it when they wake up in the morning and they're thinking about it when they go to sleep at night and they're cursing the day that the Magnitsky Act was passed and that their names got added to it. And so um, uh, there, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of victims around the world that are using the Magnitsky Act now to level the playing field. The, uh, um, the Uyghurs in, uh, in China who are ba basically being rounded up and put in concentration camps like the Nazis did to, to the Jews in, in Europe. Um, the people organizing those concentration camps, the Chinese officials have now been added to the Magnitsky Act. Um, the generals in Myanmar who are uh, responsible for the Rohingya genocide are now um, on the Magnitsky list. And, and a lot of other really bad people have been sanctioned. And not just the people who have been sanctioned, but the, there are a lot of bad people who are afraid they might be next. And so there's now a, a sort of wave of terror going through the minds of, of uh, dictators and kleptocrats everywhere as they worry that they're going to be sanction next. And so we can never, I'll never be able to bring back Sergei Magnitsky. And for, for that, it's a, you know, terrible, terrible debt of, I mean, just a terrible burden of uh, guilt that I have to live with. But I have um, done something for his legacy, which is that his name is on a piece of legislation, which will, which will save lives as people don't want to end up, uh, 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 as these bad guys have to decide, do they really want to become pariahs in the world? And some of them will choose not to do these terrible things. And, and for that, um, his death wasn't a meaningless death. How many people have been sanctioned under the Benitsky Acts around the world? Um, there are about um, 500 people sanctioned under the Magnitsky Act. Um, actually, 500 people and entities sanctioned under the Magnitsky Act in the United States. And... Um, and the rest of the world's catching up, not as quickly as I'd like, but they're catching up. But I believe that as this becomes multilateralized, as, as countries start to work together, we're going to end up in a situation where this becomes much more commonplace. It's used much more often and it's used by many more countries. And as that happens, then it becomes really a, 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 a tool where people have to say, you know, if I do something like if I do something terrible, I'm going to get caught. And if I get caught, then I'm never going to be able to leave my country again. And I'm never going to be able to use my credit card again. And I'll never be able to set up a bank account again. And that's, that's a real deterrent. So, Bill, do you ever get sick and tired of telling the story? I mean, you must have told it thousands of times. No, I never get sick and tired. This is my, you know, this is what I committed myself to doing um, when Sergei Magnitsky, after he was killed. And, um, you know, it's my duty, to, you know, he's, he's dead. I'm alive. And, and it's, it's my duty to get justice, to tell his story, to make sure that, that, um, uh, that he has a legacy and his death wasn't meaningless. And this is part of that process. So this is now your full-time mission in life. Uh, yeah. You're no longer in business. You're yeah. pursuing justice for the victims around the world. That's correct. I gave up my job as a fund manager. I don't manage anyone's money anymore. I'm a full-time human rights activist. And um, it's a lot less... Uh, profitable, but a lot more um, meaningful. Do you fear for your life ever? Um, well, uh, there's two parts of that question. Am I at risk of being killed? The answer is yes. The, the Russians hate my guts. They've been trying to get me back to Russia. Um, they've, uh, uh, they've loved, I've been threatened with death. I've been threatened with kidnapping. I've been, um, they've gone to Interpol, as you mentioned. They've gone to Interpol eight times to try to have me put on the Interpol red notice list. Um, they've uh, tried to have me extradited from the UK. They're suing me all over the world. There, there's a whole floor of the St. Petersburg troll factory where they defame me on Twitter. If you want to do an interesting experiment, say something nice about me on Twitter, you'll get like bombarded by these trolls from St. Petersburg. Um, so they're, they're act out after me in all sorts of ways. But, but, but there's a word in your question was, do I fear for my life? I don't live in fear. Um, I carry on doing what I'm doing. Because the moment I start fearing, that's when I stop doing what I'm doing. And I'm not going to stop doing what I'm doing. The Russia that we see today with people like Alexei, Alexei Navalny, obviously being, being 
first poisoned, imprisoned. Do you fear for Russia today and what exists within that society? I'm very pessimistic about Russia today based on this dictator, Vladimir Putin. He's been around for 20 years um, in a country which is supposed to have a democracy. and He's bastardized the democracy. He's killed his political opponents, Boris Nemtsov. He's poisoned Alexei Navalny, tried to kill him, exiled Gary Kasparov, put in jail on various other people. Um, and he's then tried to distract the Russian people by starting wars in Ukraine and Syria and so on and so forth. But the longer he's around, the more people are tired of him, the worse the economy gets, and the, and the more he's got to then repress people and do crazy things to stay in power. And so as long as Putin's around, I've got nothing but pessimism about what's going to happen in Russia. And my pessimism has borne fruit. I mean, it's really turned out to be true. It's, it's you know, he's, he's now a dictator for life. He's changed the constitution. He intends to stay there until the day he dies. And um, I don't know whether whether he'll succeed. I think that there's a lot of things going against him, but um, uh, you know, it's, it's not a rosy picture into the future for, for Russia because of this man. So what advice do you have for us in South Africa? We've obviously been through a period where by our own estimates, we lost between a trillion and one and a half trillion rand to corruption, fraud, to the Guptas, to, to our former president. Much of that capital now sits in places like India, Dubai, other parts of the United Arab Emirates. What, are you, what advice do you give us as a, a society? We've been through kind of two years of the Zondo Commission of Inquiry into corruption, but we, we aren't seeing people being arrested. We're not seeing the recovery of any assets. We, we've actually just destroyed the wealth of our nation in South Africa. So what advice do you give us? Well, um, it's, it's, it's a tough one because if your government can't do it, um, who can you know, I mean, that's why that's why the United States sanctioned the Guptas, because your own law enforcement didn't prosecute them. And it's a really um, ugly and awful situation. And, and um, I, I wish there was an easy answer. I mean, this this is, um, you know, uh, I mean, it's possible. I mean, we, we've also chased the money from the Magnitsky case. We found out where it went. It's possible to do. I mean, it's money laundering actually never really the money never disappears. I mean, the money goes somewhere. There's a, there's a permanent record of where that money is. You just need to have some capable, talented people um, chasing after it. And I, I, I fear and I, uh, that based on what I've seen in South Africa, that, that either there's no political will to do it, or there's no capability to do it, or there's corruption that continues on in South Africa. And um, that's a really heartbreaking situation. And I, I have, I actually have very close ties to South Africa. I went there 20 years ago and fell in love with the country and, and bought a house in Cape Town. And, uh, and I, I would go there two, three times a year for many years. And, uh, uh, and, I, and by the way, I had to stop traveling to South Africa because I can't go to my house anymore because, uh, because of all these connections between the, the uh, uh, Zuma government and, and, uh, and Putin and all the corruption. And, and I, I wish I could tell you some, some like, you know, quick fix. It's not, it, it requires political will and, and skill to go after the money, but it's not, it's not rocket science. We did it with Mag, the Magnitsky case uh, easily with the resources of a, of a government. The South African government can go out and figure out where this money is and who the culprits are and, and ask for assistance from other countries and prosecute these people and seize the money. So, Bill, there seems to have been some sort of connection between the Zoom administration and the Putin administration on nuclear cooperation, maybe potentially bribes paid in order to, to build nuclear facilities in South Africa. Can you give us any light on that at all? Has anything come to your attention that we should know about in South Africa relating to the relationship between the two countries? Um, well, I, I, I think you can pretty much safely assume that um, uh, Putin both bribed and then threatened um, Zuma um, to do to like basically hand over the keys to the electricity grid into perpetuity in South Africa um, uh, or something to that effect. And um, uh, and and it was it was remarkable when I was watching this thing unfold. And I, I don't have any inside knowledge, but, you know, you'd have finance minister after finance minister saying this is a bad idea. And then he would just find, fire the finance minister and bring some new guy in something really ugly was going on um, just under the surface. 
um, I don't know what it was, but um, you know, th there are no secrets in the end. Yeah, we just don't know when the end is. So, Bill, there are a huge number of questions. If you don't mind, we'd love to go into question time. I know a lot of people want to ask about connections relating to South Africa. Just before we do, uh, North Face Capital is our sponsor for tonight. A huge thank you to Andrew Diamond for sponsoring tonight. We're going to watch a very quick one-minute advert from North Face Capital, and we're going to come back with all of your questions. So just a reminder to all of you, if you're watching us on Zoom, please Put your questions in the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. If you're watching us on Facebook or YouTube, please use the comment sections on either of those two platforms. And Danny will bring those questions across and ben Benji will be helping to answer all of that. So let's see the North Face uh, Capital advert and we'll be back in a minute's time. Looking for office space, industrial space, showroom or restaurant space for your business? North Face Capital develops and builds the right property solution for your business. Top of the line, flexible, customized modern solutions that contribute to high employee productivity and customer satisfaction. Go to northfacecapital.co.za to find flexible, productive, quality space for your business. North Face Capital, developing for today, growing together for tomorrow. Andrew Diamond, thank you for your sponsorship this evening. You have first opportunity to ask Bill a question. So it's an absolute privilege to, to, to meet you, Bill, and uh, thank you very much for, for, for joining us. Absolute privilege. Um, so uh, I think one of the, the I've got two, two questions to, to start with. So the first one is if you take the American um, legal system and, and business system and investment system and obviously there's flaws there and, and whatever you, you know, there's, there's problems but let's benchmark that as 10 out of 10 where would you put russia the legal system the investing system and so that's part a and part b which you you obviously are expert on russia but where would you estimate estimate south africa is relative on that uh, on that scale well, so 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 um, Russia, so if America is a 10, Russia is a zero. There's basically no law whatsoever in Russia. It's just completely lawless. Um, South Africa is an interesting place because South Africa has all the um, uh, sort of plumbing, the infrastructure. Um, and, and so, you know, you have really good high court judges and, and, and uh, so on. I think the real the problem with South Africa is not as much the legal system as it is the government. Um, uh, you know, the government is not very, uh, or has been highly dysfunctional. But, I, you know, I, if, if I were having a dispute over a, you know, business deal in South Africa, and I went to court, I would have pretty high confidence that the dispute would be adjudicated properly and fairly. And, I, and maybe I'm just naive. I mean, I, I haven't spent a lot of time in South African courts, but that's my, my sort of superficial impression. Um, but I've also seen that that the government, from you know, and we've we've seen now, you know, this whole dysfunction from the um, Zuma administration and the Guptas and so on. And and um, why why now can they not get get a handle on that and, and um, you know chase down the money and it just and prosecute the individuals and and it looks to me like there's a lot of people who were part of that who are still in decision making places who can who can scupper these investigations. Yeah. Okay. I think that's. Uh, I think that's very accurate. Um, thank you. Um, and the, the 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 next one is when you look back at your time in Russia, and, and, and maybe it's easy now with twenty twenty vision, but it looks like a pretty linear trade. So so somewhat similar to the two thousand and eight debt crisis, where you know in, in any investment, obviously it can go both ways, and and it's not really linear. But in Russia, from from as I say, with twenty twenty vision now. And um, in 2008, there wasn't that much downside, but the upside was like unlimited. So any pointers or, or indicators of what, what the next linear trade could be? Is it, is it China? Is it property? You know, where, what, 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 do you th what, what, what do you think would, would, would be something there to look at? Well, I, I, um, uh, everyone always asks me that question. And the only thing that I, I can see, which, which has almost no downside, and an unlimited upside is shorting uh, bonds. 
so you have you have interest rates that are zero, <laughs> um, and so um, how much lower can interest rates go? And you have inflation now, which is pretty much on fire everywhere, um, which means that they probably go up. So. Uh, I mean, I'm not a I'm not a macro trader, but that's the one thing which is just so absurd right now is that um, you know, and it's being manipulated by central banks. And some would argue you don't ever want to bet against the Fed or bet against central banks, but but that's the one place I can see that 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 uh, things will, will uh, only are asymmetric in one direction. Problem with that trade is it's not like a hundred bagger if you um, if you if you do well. Um, I mean, I think that we're going to end up in a world at some point. When, when interest rates do go up and inflation does get out of control, um, where asset prices will collapse and then there'll be all sorts of interesting pockets of opportunity. Right now, asset prices are expensive in almost every different sector and I can't see anything that, that sort of screams at me the way Russia does. Um, at the same time, it's kind of hard not to invest because you, if you sit on cash, um, it's being devalued at 5% a year. And so, you know, what, what do you do with that? So, Bill, I want to introduce you to Saar Jacobs, who is the largest head fund manager in South Africa. Hmm. Uh, so, Saar, you've actually had a lot of experience in dealing with Russian companies as well. You you speak to them on a regular basis. Yeah, well, it's a, it's an absolute great pleasure for me to, to meet you, Bill. I mean, I've followed your history for all my years. I read your book probably soon after it was published. Um, <laughs> I've actually taken a lot of those lessons uh, particularly in your book, for example, I remember the one rights issue you went through where the rights issue didn't apply to all of the investors, but rather to everyone besides you. Uh, so these days I probably read rights issue announcements a little bit closer than, than potentially I would have done uh, pre your book. Uh, great privilege to meet you and to you know, you know, have meet you in person, which is phenomenal. Uh, I was actually live on Twitter at the time when you were put in the Spanish police car uh, and luckily, people don't know on this on this call, but luckily you had your mobile with you and you were able to tweet that you're getting taken by yeah. Spanish police. Uh, and by the time you got to the police station, because of Twitter and your following, uh, there were already people waiting for you there. Uh, who knows if you never had your mobile, what would have happened to you? I mean, give us some idea of, of the feeling then. I mean, you make out as if it hasn't been a dangerous life, but I think it's been a particularly dangerous life for you. <clears throat> Well, it, 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 so it, you know, they say like, you know, in, in battle and war, it's, um, uh, it's, you know, days and days of boredom punctuated by um, moments of absolute fear. And I would say that that's probably, um, I, I wouldn't say my life is boring, but, but I would say that, that um, uh, you know, there, there are these moments like I, when I was being arrested in Madrid and I didn't know whether I was being arrested in Madrid or whether I was being illegally rendered in Madrid because you know I thought maybe these guys were just dressed up as police officers and maybe they were just working for the Russians and they put inject me with something and I wake up in a Russian prison and, and I had been warned by the U.S. government that there was a um, uh, uh, a plot to kidnap me and um, uh, and so for a while I was having to like you know be in lay low have bodyguards etc cetera, etc cetera. but the um uh you know, in any circumstance, no matter how bad your circumstances are in life, you kind of get used to it after a while. And, um, you know, everyone says, what does it feel like to, you know, have the Russians after you want to kill you? And, and um, you know, for, for a while, it was like something I'd have to explain to people. But, you know, the whole world has joined me. <clears throat> you, you know, nobody else has the Russians after them, or maybe most people don't. But, you know, everybody could, could wake up tomorrow with COVID and find themselves, you know, intubated and, and um dying of COVID. And so we're, we're all in a world where we don't know what's going to happen next. And so, you know, you just kind of roll with the punches in life and, and you, you get used to it. And, and I mean, the one thing I haven't done is back down and, and I haven't backed down because, as I feel very strongly that um, Sergei Magnitsky, you know, took much greater risks than I did on my behalf. And, and I owe it to him to, to make sure that the people who killed him rue that day for the rest of their lives. And I, I won't stop doing it. Um, for that reason, absolutely. but absolutely, and I think I mean, uh, I mean, in your in your to your credit, I mean, you've done a phenomenal job in in ensuring that his name, you know, lives forever yeah. in in that act. Uh, I mean, you just mentioned COVID a second ago. I mean, I heard earlier in, in the media that Putin has somehow contracted COVID. I wouldn't know if it's true or not true, and well, gone into isolation. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not but sure I, I, I'm I, sad I, about I, that event, but. 
that that's interesting. I, I'll have to look that up. I hadn't heard that. Yeah. It's an interesting rumor. But you know, people are always spreading rumors about Putin's health. Correct. They were saying he has cancer. He has Parkinson's disease. He has all this and that. I mean, um, he seems to be. Um, he's got the <clears throat> best health care money can buy. So I'm sure he'll be fine. Yeah, interesting. Um, you talked about Putin's corporate interests and obviously him holding all the shares effectively via oligarchs. I mean, for us, that's also quite evident. We, we actually track his plane uh, on flight path and saw at the time when Norilsk um, Nickel, the, the big palladium producer in Russia, uh, sprung a huge leak and it was, uh, looks like they weren't able to produce palladium for a while. Next thing, within two days, the Putin jet arrived on site uh, mm-hmm. as we tracked it. So, uh, obviously still very involved in, in the corporate world. And although he's the president, obviously there are a lot of corporate interests. So, you know, it, it is recognized globally. And it will be interesting to know how he ever gets out of that situation. I mean, how, how the world ever reverses him out of that situation. Would it be an oligarch mm-hmm. potentially who kills him one day? Uh, would it be one of his own henchmen? Um, I mean, something must happen at, at some stage. Well, I mean, there, there's basically three, 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 sort of outcomes status quo which i think is the most likely that he that he um <clears throat> stays in power until the day he dies of natural causes and i would probably give that a 70 percent probability uh, palace coup where some oligarch or general in the fsb decides that they want to take it all and somehow convince their other people that that's the right way to do it I, and and if that were to happen it would just be more of status quo just a different a different bad guy who then could be around for another 25 years, <clears throat> 20% probability, or um, uh, revolution, you know, Alexei Navalny type of thing. And I'd give that a 10% probability. And so, you know, as a, uh, uh, you know, person who looks at statistics and making <laughs> informed financial decisions, you know, I wouldn't say there's a high likelihood that he's going to not be in power. No, I think you're right on that. I mean, I'm just just interesting some things you told us today. I mean, I was also at one of the last Grateful Dead concerts in 1987 <laughs> as an exchange student in California. So good to know I've got a fellow deadhead uh, <laughs> on, on this call. Uh, interesting, I could have also used a lot of your skill in the last few years. I think unlike Russia, the big difference in South Africa is we've had a bit of corporate funnies going on. You know, the government hasn't been that involved in our financial system. It's held up its independence like the judiciary which you said, uh, but we've seen a lot of interesting corporate frauds emerge and very powerful people, you know, not as powerful as a Putin, who've obviously <coughs> caused a, a, a lot of pain, like the Guptas, you know, but in the listed commercial world. And, uh, you know, would it be nice to have you on our side uh, fighting some of those legitimately in South Africa, um, which we one day may look forward to. I just asked oh, one he's, question. He's, he's, he's always on our side. I want to ask a quick <laughs> question, and then we're going to have very short questions from both you and Andrew, and we're going to pass Perfect. it over to Benji, who's going to expand the conversation to all the questions that have come in. Bill, I want to know, how many copies of Red Notice have you, in fact, sold? Uh, Red, Red Notice, in, in all languages, has sold more than a million copies. And, and, I, can, uh, I, and I can... Do you know how many, many in South Africa? I have no idea. But let me just tell you one other thing, which is very new news and for you and your audience here tonight, which is last week, I have submitted to my publisher, uh, Simon & Schuster, my um, sequel to Red Notice. It's called Freezing Order. And um, it's just being edited now and it will be out in June of next year. So you have, if you like Red Notice, you'll love Freezing Order. Um, Keep your eye out for it. Can Can we book you for the first week of June next year to come back? I'm sure we can. (laughs) <laughs> Andrew, quick question from you and then a question from Sai and then we're handing over to Benji. So, um, so Bill, the, the question is, with the Magnitsky Act um, affecting, so let's take the Guptas as an example, um, what, what does it practically mean? I mean, these guys are still living large. How, how does it, I, I want to see the claws. I want to see the, the claw marks on their backs and the blood coming through their shirts. <laughs> Well, so, so the answer is they might be living large, but um, uh, I'm not sure exactly how they do that because what happens when you're on the Magnitsky list? Um, your money basically gets frozen. You, know, you, you don't have access to your money anymore because no bank wants to be in. So <clears throat> let's say that you have $100 million in a bank in India. Let's say the Guptas have $100 million in the Bank of India. <clears throat> um, if that bank 
uh, transacts with them, gives them the money, gives them the cash, wires the money for them, um, that bank will be in violation of US OFAC sanctions. And that bank will be subject to fines equal to three times the amount of money that was in the transaction. And so effectively, every bank in the world freezes the assets of the person who's been sanctioned. And so I'm not sure exactly how they're living large. Maybe they already own houses that are that they paid for. Um, but I guarantee you that all of a sudden this is uh, this is a uh, you know a truly um, devastating development. There's claw marks on their back, on their front, on their forehead with this stuff. Um, it's really you know the, the, the Mastercard and Visa will no longer do business. You know they can't use their credit cards anymore. They apply for a visa anywhere in the world, and the first thing they're going to look when they when they Google their names to any country that requires a visa is these guys are on the Magnitsky list. We're not giving them a visa. Um, their planes no longer fly because they use U.S. avionics. They they can't use Microsoft Word because Microsoft um, will not do business with sanctioned individuals. Um, the license will be canceled. I mean, and, and I'm I'm not, I'm not just making these things up. These things happen. So I, I know specific examples when this stuff happens. These guys are just cursing every day, all day, the fact that they're on the Magnitsky list. There's, there's, they're feeling the pain big time. Well, when, Sorry, when you're, I'm... You're, sorry uh, Andrew, I'm going to just ask Sai for his quick question. Yeah, just sorry, the last, last question for you, Bill, is just the, the, the amount of, uh, of asset managers that are now in Russia. We've seen a huge increase, likes of prosperity, capital. Do you think that the market is a lot cleaner, the listed market, than it was at the time that you exposed all the funnies, the corporate funnies then? I, 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 I think that if you look at the number of, uh, the amount of capital and the number of managers in Russia now, um, it's, a, it's a, uh, a shadow of its former self. And just to give you an example, um, uh, so I, I was the largest public equity fund manager in Russia, and, I, and this is what happened to me. The largest private equity fund manager is a guy named Mike Calvi, who, who ran Bering's Vostok. Um, and he was a big friend of, of the regime and, and always good mouth regime, never exposed corruption, never, never had any problems with any, create any problems with anybody. And they stuck him and all of his entire fund management team in jail um, because he was fighting with a well-connected oligarch. There, there, there's not a lot of capital in Russia. There might be, you know, people, you know, sort of trading in and trading out, but it's not anything like it was before. And, and uh, it's, uh, it's really a, a, a sort of kind of, well, I mean, I consider China the same thing. It's, when you can't, when you can't look at the economics of a company to make an investment because you don't know who's going to steal from you when, that, that becomes effectively a casino. It's not an investment place. And so, you know, yes, some people can make money on the ups and downs, but it's not a place where you can. Put your money to work and 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 believe that they, the the um, that that anyone will be a good fiduciary for you there. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you, Porter. You've been you've been looking at all the questions that have been coming in. Just very quickly, we want to tell people th that Red Notice Bill's book is available through Take a Lot. Is available through Loot. You can get it at exclusive books. CNA. If you have not read this book. You are doing yourself a great disservice. Do yourself a favor tomorrow, order a copy of Red Notice. You will never, ever regret it. Also available on Audible, a great listen on Audible as well. So Benji, tell us what uh, the audience is asking. So, Bill, your courage is inspiring. So uh, a lot of our audience want to know if you're still in contact with Sergei's uh, widow and his children and what they are up to. Uh, yeah, so I am... Um, uh... They, 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 after Sergei died, um, they wanted to stay in Russia, and I, which I felt very unhappy about. And it took me um, several years to convince them to leave Russia and um, come to London. But, but I was able to convince them, and I brought them to London. And um, Sergei's widow works with me on the Magnitsky justice campaign, and his son has just um, gone to university in America. But, but they, they've all been living here safely, became British citizens and um, under my financial support and protection and are trying to rebuild their lives as best as one can in this type of terrible scenario. Do you think that the, the act is, is compromised by the increase in crypto trade and, and the, the advancements in crypto trade? Yeah, 
I do. I think not just the acts, but all government regulation against money laundering, terrorist financing, and Ill other illicit activities is, is hugely harmed by cryptocurrencies. You know, you can't go to a bank and take out more than $10,000 in cash without giving, like writing an essay about why you need the $10,000 and then it gets filed with all relevant authorities. You can move $10 million in various cryptocurrencies um, and no one can ever know. And, uh, you know, for what it's worth, um, that, is the, that is the Achilles heel of the whole cryptocurrency business. Um, I don't believe for a second that governments are going to allow uh, cryptocurrencies to exist in this libertarian free-for-all because it violates all these any money laundering regulations. And, and, uh, uh, and so what will happen for sure is that most every civilized country will um, not outlaw cryptocurrencies, but just say that all cryptocurrencies have to be properly reported and, and fully disclosed to all relevant authorities and the, anyone dealing in cryptocurrencies have to do, do, do that and so on and so forth. And um, uh, I think that will eliminate a huge amount of, of cryptocurrency demand when, when a lot of bad guys um, can no longer use it as a way of bypassing sanctions. Um, was your was your reception in in the U.S. a bit frostier with the with the, the previous president? Well, um, it's, I mean, so the, the Donald Trump was a lot different than his administration. Donald Trump's administration actually was was populated by some quite good people, but Donald Trump um, was really a nightmare for me, um, and the nightmare you know, fully realized itself in 2018 at the uh, Trump-Putin summit in Helsinki. And at that summit, uh, at the press conference afterwards, uh, Putin asked Trump to hand me over to the Russians. And Trump thought that was a great idea. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it took a few days before he walked that back and said, that's not such a good idea. And if Trump had been reelected, I probably wouldn't have been able to travel to America uh, in his second term because during the first term he was under investigation with the Mueller, uh, Mueller report, and you know uh, all that kind of stuff. In the second term, he would have, not, he, you know, he could easily have just instructed his homeland security to put me on a jet to Russia. Uh, John McCain's death did that impact you uh, uh, in terms of like the kind of traction you were getting? And is there a Republican that that is? Uh, more helpful uh, in your in your quest to advance the Mizanitsky Act. Well, Senator John McCain's death was probably one of the one of the most significant things that happened in Washington, because John McCain was a man of principle, and it, we wouldn't have we, we wouldn't have seen the kind of craven political catastrophe of many. Uh, people in the Republican Party, John McCain had been around because he was a stalwart of integrity. And um, that, that, that doesn't mean that, that um, all Republicans sort of fell in with Donald Trump. I have a lot of good Republicans on my side, a lot of them. And there's one in particular, his name is Senator Roger Wicker from Mississippi, who, who basically has taken up the mantle from McCain and has been a huge champion of the Magnitsky Act and, and has been a great friend to our cause and a great friend to the oppressed and um, uh, and when I when Donald Trump wanted to hand me over, he was the first to step up and say that that ain't happening. And so there's the you know the, the, it's easy to paint broad brushes on things, but um, there's a lot of good folks there too. No. Um, do you see uh, a lot of our viewers want to know whether you see and you have spoken a little bit about it, but maybe more specifically, uh, huge similarities between Russia and China. And recently, our own market has been really severely affected by some of the activities of Russia and a lot of value being, it has been destroyed by uh, some of the activities of the Chinese government. Some may be justified, some not, through some of the, the big, uh, the big uh, uh, shares that have interest there. What is your view on the similarities between the two? Well, they're both dictatorships. 
In both countries, there's no rule of law. In both countries, there's no freedom of press. In both countries, there's no freedom of speech. And so, um, and both countries are kleptocracies. Um, and by the way, a great book has just come out. It's called Red Roulette. My book is called Red yeah. Notice. There's a book yeah. called Red Roulette. It's written by a guy named Desmond Shum. I know Desmond. He was a aspiring sort of Chinese oligarch who fell out with the regime. And he describes in great detail how the Chinese government is in on all these scams in a really ugly way. And so um, China has got a lot, does a better job of sort of managing their publicity. Russia doesn't do a very good job of that, but they're both kleptocracies, dictatorships, and places where if you have, if you have business there and you have trouble with the government, there's nothing you can do. Um, and so I, uh, I've been saying this about China for a long time and everyone says, oh, you know, if I had listened to you, I wouldn't have made all this money. Well, now all of a sudden it's all, you know, uh, chickens coming home to roost. So you would stay clear. There's no doubt in your mind based on your experience. I, I have stayed clear. I would stay clear. You can't go to places where there's no rule of law and no freedom of speech and freedom of press, because what do you do if you get ripped off? I mean, everybody, the, the human nature is if somebody has power and they can rip you off, they'll rip you off if there's no consequence. And there's no consequence in places with no rule of law. It just doesn't make any sense to go to those places. And so everybody's saying, oh, look at these growth rates. Look at, look at how, how, you know, how, the, how big the population is, how much money you can make. Well, you can't make that any money, that money if they steal it from you. And there's like human nature is to steal from one another if, no, if nobody puts some breaks in place to stop it. So how so we Benji, let, me, let me ask one, one last yeah, question. Yeah, I think you've got been, time for, for yes. one last question. So, uh, so how worried should we be that our deputy president is getting uh, I don't know, like a lot of vacation time or medical treatment in Russia? Um, how worried should we be here in SA? I know you've answered that in some other uh, aspects, but what's well, your view I, on that? Well, I guarantee you that the Russians will be trying to get to him. And the only question is, you know, is he a man of of principle and integrity and and um, is he immune to that type of approach or will the Russians succeed? I, unfortunately, I, I we, we know the answer to that question. <laughs> Howie, I'll let you answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> Bill, there, there'd be questions. Uh, we, you told us about a sequel. Is there going to be a movie? Because the story and the story of your life is not only a remarkably inspiring story, but a, it really is one of the most gripping stories ever told. Would we ever expect to, to see a movie? Um, well, I, I don't think there'll be a movie, but there'll be a mini series. We're, we're working on that right now. So, uh, you know, watch this space. I, I, can I presume Brad Pitt will be playing it? No, too ugly. <laughs> <laughs> Bill Brother, it's been such a pleasure to have you on this, e this evening. I think for everyone watching in South Africa, this issue of being able to achieve justice in your own society and your own country based on what we've been through and how the country has been destroyed by corruption over the last 10 years is such an important issue in all of our lives. And I think you've given us a glimmer of hope. And part of that hope is we have to make sure that we never give up, that we're always dogged and determined to pursue justice no matter what cost. And ultimately, you and Sergei have paid the ultimate cost to your lives. You know, him with his life himself and you changing the entire direction of your life in order to pursue justice. But the satisfaction and fulfillment that I think you've told us that you've achieved by fulfilling justice over or pursuing justice has really made this all worthwhile. Do you think in, in retrospect, when you look back at your entire career, what, what would you have done differently? What have you learned from this? Are there lessons that maybe you can share? Well, the main lesson is that um, I should have just stayed in California after Stanford and gone to Silicon Valley. I probably would have made more money and I would have been dealing with nice people and, and everyone would still be alive, uh, uh, still alive today. So it's, um, you know, I, I wouldn't have changed anything about what I did when I, um, uh, you know, I, I mean, I, I, I would have always fought fought against the corruption. I would have always um, stood up for Sergei Magnitsky. I would have done everything the same. The one thing I wouldn't have done is gone to Russia in the first place. Yeah. So I, I know, Andrew, you want to give uh, uh, Bill one last comment. I'm trying to start your camera and I'm going to turn on 
size camera as well, just so everyone can say thank you for your time and thank you for sharing such a remarkable story and such amazing life lessons. Andrew? Thank you very much, Bill. Um, I've, I've, learned, uh, I've learned a lot reading the book and I've, I've learned a tremendous amount tonight. But I think the biggest lesson for me was um, your humility and your loyalty to Sergey and his family. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, a Sorry, tribute to you. A tribute to you, Bill. Really a sensational story. And I could sense the emotion of how much you feel for Sergey. And uh, I think you've lived up to his expectation. I'm sure he's looking down on you today and very proud of the work that you've done throughout the world. Thank you. So, so to everyone who's listened tonight, uh, just a reminder that a recording of this evening is available on YouTube. You can access it through the South African Jewish Report YouTube channel at any point in time. For those people who are fasting tomorrow evening for Yom Kippur, we wish you a Gamal Khatima Tova. We'll be back next week, Thursday, with something much different to tonight, much lighter, much more entertaining, but certainly not more inspiring than the evening we've had tonight. Bull Brother, you truly are a light to all of us. Thank you for everything that you've done in your life and for the justice that you continue to pursue and the hope you give to all of us. Thank you. Good night. And, thank you, Bill. And, and thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.